Welcome to Lover's Hole, the Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Mike. And you're with a very happy Ian who's got his particular friend back again. Well, yeah, let me say I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a ghost of my former self, but I am back on perpetual make and mend day, nodding and splicing biologically and sending out a lot of thanks for all you folks who've written such great comments and, and messages and everything. Um, you know, a, a little bit hollowed out, but great to be back with my particular friend, Ian, and all you folks with a lover's all. Ah, marvelous. Mike, it's a happy day. We're still in our crossing the line format here. We've got a great show lined up for you. We're going to look back at uh, episodes, where are we now, 1 through 64. Um, we hope you enjoyed thinking about comedy and humor last week. This week, we're going to think about Patrick O'Brien and children, about the characters that he writes as children, about the way his adult characters encounter and uh, and live alongside kids. Besides having me and Mike opining, um, we're also going to get to spend some time with a new guest, a new friend of the podcast, Steve Morris, co-host of the Cinephiles podcast, an all-round good guy. He's going to come and sit with us as well. Great. Boy, I, I, and I love, Ian, the, the talk that you had with Steve, and I love, love, love their podcast. I tell you what, I, I, I had a little bit of a, a wandering back to my childhood. I was re-listening to their podcast on The Exorcist, one of their Halloween specials. And I remember that as a kid oh, going boy. to see this movie when it first premiered. And boy, I, well, I've got the uh, the goosebumps are running right up my arm again. They did such a fabulous job, Steve and John, on that one. Well, we'll tell you more details about Cinephiles and how you can get hold of that later on. And, and Mike, as we've sort of thumbed through our catalog of you know clips and quotes and you know backstory stuff, I think one of the first things that we we came across is that O'Brien has really enjoyed right from the beginning of Master and Commander portraying a certain kind of joy, a certain kind of lightness from the fact that there are kids alongside the adults in this apparently quite grown up world. We've got youngsters, we've got midshipmen, we've got some some big names of midshipmen who became a big part of the story that we'll talk about later on. But even as early as Master and Commander, Jack was paying attention to the youngsters, right? Right. And, and we have folks that we've, you know, kind of watched grow up like Babington referred to as a mere child in Master mm-hmm. Commander. And we're thinking about him, you know, in Surgeon's Mate, we're thinking about him you know, past that, we're thinking about him as we talked about last week with the lesbians. We're thinking about, you know, Babington as, as a more grown up guy. But, you know, he was one of the squeakers once upon a time. And it's one of those Patrick O'Brien words, isn't it? Along with can it be et and sloths and <laughs> prating, squeakers is core Patrick O'Brien vocabulary. We don't even have to do Google Engram on that one. That's the word. And we've got this odd mix, I think, in O'Brien. Jack especially loves them but he thinks they're pretty useless. Like emotionally he grows and grows into the role of kind of an educator and a mentor to these younger folks, but as actual practical worthwhile humans to sit on the deck of a ship, he's not convinced at all. I don't know. No, he does have this kind of, um, you know, it's not love hate, but it's that, you know, the kind of the flip of the coin there between, you know, I think as you say, in as, as Jack matures himself, and reflects, you know, as he's gotten older, and we've had that as a theme, he's reflecting back on his youth and his childhood, thinking, what do I wish that I had back then? What can I be doing for these youngsters on my ship right now? These midshipmen, minor characters, again, that O'Brien does such a wonderful job bringing to life. Um, and none more minor in Jack's eyes than the midshipmen there, not, not fit for man or beast. Jack remembers coming up as a midshipman, actually, you know, as we're going to find out, we're going to reminisce a little bit about his midshipman life in this book. And even though the lively where he is, as as you point out, Ian, in this blockading, you know, even their midshipmen still have a lot to learn. Mind you, he's, he's doing his best to correct that, though, isn't he? Yeah, it's fascinating. He's he's acting as teacher. He's also sitting in on their classes. And, and I love this part where as he's attending specifically their their navigation classes, he is. Uh, uh, and and getting impacted by this lively atmosphere of more scientific. We also get this relationship between Jack in particular and youngsters who need need educating. It shines through in the movie, I thought, as well as some great interaction between Jack and the youngsters, especially young Blakeney, who gets injured in the earlier part of the movie. It's just lovely. We see him interacting with them, laughing with them, teaching them, and it's a really kind of heartwarming part of the story. Bring the sun down to the horizon. 
When its lower limb is touching the horizon... Williamson, look to your sextant. The orb is no longer rising. Then, it has reached its zenith. And that would be noon. Sir? Mr. Pullins, could you make noon, Mr. Hollum? Yes, sir. Call noon. It's your class. Sir, that's noon. I think we've got him, sir. And the wind favours us this time. Uh, don't count your eggs before they're in the pudding, Mr. Callamy. Still, if we can close this gap and get up behind her, she may well be ours. Touch wood. Scratch a stay. Turn three times. May the Lord save the preserves. Now, Jack seems also sometimes to be challenged in his role as a father shall we say right right i you know i think in two ways one you know he's certainly challenged in in time because he's just not there he's not there a lot and he's also challenged because it sounds like his upbringing was not the best in the world well at least his upbringing at home because he was on a boat pretty early on yeah he was raised at sea right he knows about the sea upbringing but not the what do you do when you're at home? And I think he's particularly called out. Um, and we have some great lines uh, from the books. What do I do with girls? Oh, my God. You know, what do I do with girls? Yes. And he and Stephen have some great conversations <laughs> about that. This whole idea of being slightly dissatisfied or disappointed, certainly from Jack's point of view and in the things that Jack says and observes upon, ends up carrying this theme with it that I thought I picked up anyway of a little bit of misogyny. There's a little bit of bah, women. He is a little bit down on the fact that his daughters are girls. And I, I think he's expressing it in a way that says, I, I wish I could help them more. I could help them if they were boys. Yeah. But that's a point of departure that he's he's got daughters rather than sons. Well, Stephen sure calls him out on it that, you know, that you know, calls him yeah. little swabs. <laughs> and seems like, you know, how come you're being so <laughs> negative to your girls, Jack? Right. And, you know, the, He's a little bit puzzled sometimes about how to handle them. And he, I, I love moments when he gets home. He gets home from a long voyage and he's really wishing to see Sophie and he's really wishing to see the kids. And he realizes he's he's an alien back from another world and he's landed in this alien world. Now, at the moment when they're, they, he finds the kids and they don't recognize him and they're on a protest mark. Right, right. As he's riding around the outer grounds and approaching the house and it's quiet and He's listening, listening, listening for any sign that his three children are there. You know, Jack gets close enough. He hails the house. And we know Jack has a voice that will carry forever. Yeah. And here's nothing. It appears to be deserted. Um, he gets to the stable. He tends to his horse lovingly and caringly, <laughs> even though he's been so brutal to it on the way up. But uh, all of a sudden, his three children, who are, are much grown, come marching by one of the daughters turns and tells him to come back tomorrow. Everyone is gone. And then they, you know, sort of commanding her little unit, they march off chanting Wilkes and Liberty, which we don't know yet, but is a <laughs> to Jack's father's new political affiliation. And so we got Jack, who's never set eyes on his son before, seeing him marching along with his twin sisters and headed out because none of them recognize Jack as their father. Wilkes and Liberty. <laughs> well, and I, yeah. I think Wilkes and Liberty remind us of his uh, a bit tortured upbringing. I mean, we've got not only whatever happened as a youngster, but even still, you know, he has this tortured relationship with his dad, who, who I think still sees yeah. him as a bit of a child anyway. So, yeah. And I mean, the deeper you go, I think, into O'Brien's treatment of children, the more you start to think. I wonder what his family relationships were like. Right. And we're going to dig into that a little bit later on in the conversation with Steve, I think. Nice. So I think we get the sense that for, for Jack, at least, his own children and the children that he raises as a surrogate at sea are sometimes a mystery to him. But generally, they're about joy and growth and lightness and, and they're played for laughs yes. some of the time as yes. well. I, I, and I think we see a really different attitude. One of the core attitudes that Stephen seems to have is anxiety, almost kind of trepidation at the idea of bringing kids into the world. And this, this comes up a couple of times, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Stephen, over and over in the canon, talks about there's no need to have any more kids. I wouldn't want to bring a kid into this world. 
You know, there are plenty of kids to take care of as it is now. He sent word that Diana's had difficulty in the pregnancy, that she might not carry the child to term. And Stephen is almost heartbreakingly kind of phlegmatic about this. He says, just as well, there are far, far too many children as it is. Oh, surely, sir, cried Dr. Farber, who had five with another Jew in a few weeks' time. Surely, sir, said Stephen, no thinking man will deliberately entail life upon still another being in this overcrowded world perpetually at war. Perhaps, sir, suggested Farber, not all children are deliberately not begotten. No, says Stephen. This is the Enlightenment philosopher Stephen coming out here. No, if men were to consider what they were at, if they were to look about them and reflect upon the cost of life in a universe where prisons, brothels, madhouses and regiments of men armed and trained to kill other men are so very common, why, I doubt we should see many of these pure, mewling little larval victims so often a present misery to their parents and a future menace to their kind. Oh, man. Wow. So, Mike, I, I'm looking at this thinking, I hope this is just situational. You know, I, I hope this is just Stephen at a low ebb because this is a very bleak point of view for him to have, especially given that he might be connected to Diana who might be about to produce a child. Right. But I, I've got a feeling that a part of this, the sort of skepticism about the world, I think that's Stephen. And I think he's always a, a bit half-hearted about the idea that we conjure children into being in what is otherwise a cruel world. But for me, the part that makes me kind of sad on his behalf is that he's prepared to see children themselves in a bad light. And when we know he's had some very warm, some very loving contacts with children, we think about the... Yeah. And and one interesting turn later where he does have a moment in his own life thinking about, well, perhaps though, perhaps a child could play a different role, you know, and and, and almost feeling like a traitor to himself and thinking that maybe there is an exception under which he might want to bring a child into this world. Well, yeah, I, I think we're talking about the moment when he's considering Diana, right? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and for all we know that in connection with Diana, Stephen's never had a clear head. Like He's never had <laughs> balanced perspective. But there's this moment, isn't there, where he's kind of, I think he's, he's standing uh, on the ship at anchor watching her arriving, and he's thinking to himself, I, I, can't, I can't even say the words out loud. He's thinking to himself, maybe a child will help to calm Diana down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. In the Iona mission, he's, you know, he's kind of, you know, they've they've just coached overnight. Stephen's gotten on board late. He's looking through his telescope back at the, you know, at, at land. And Sophie's there with the kids waving. Diana's there standing next to young yellow. And and Stephen's having the thought that you said right there. That was uh, that was something exactly. Ha! Yeah. Huh. And and who's he standing with at that time? As he's contemplating on the possible evolution of Diana into a loving maternal character, who's he? Who's he in, in company with? He's in company with <laughs> with Yagiello. Right, right, exactly. There, there's Yagiello standing right next to Diana over on the shore as Stephen sails away. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, we should remember this. Well, as we say, stick a pin in that, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Gosh. Well, and we have, I mean, I think Ava Sanders said, you know, several times back when she was on that, you know, we often talk about uh, O'Brien and and kind of his writing being a little bit like Jane Austen's. And she mentioned that it was also a lot like Dickens, especially yeah. his magnificent use of secondary characters. And boy, we have got children filling that role all over the place. I mean, from the midshipman Forshaw, oh, uh, yes. certainly I, I think one of the most poignant moments of the canon for everybody. I know certainly for me and for you and Steve yeah. has talked about it as well. I mean, it, it comes back to children and he writes them so well. He certainly does. And this is a really great moment to hop over and listen in to the conversation I had earlier with our good friend, Steve Morris. I want to welcome to the show, new friend of the show, Steve Morris. Steve, among many other things, um, co-host of the excellent Cinephiles podcast. Tell us just for the listeners a little bit about your interest in the O'Brien books and how that links to your your other passion and podcasting about movies and TV shows. For, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. I am a big fan of The Lover's Hole. I was looking, I was going through my, I don't know if it's my fifth or sixth time through the books. Oh and gosh. I went, man, I'd really like a companion. 
on this. I want to, I talked to my friend, Steve, who's also read the books, but I want more. And I did a search and found the lover's hole. And I'm really glad that I did because you and Mike, I've just been a great, uh, a, a pleasure to go with me on this journey through the books. So thank uh, you, I, first of all, for that. Sure, um, I absolutely adore these books. I've read them many, many times. They definitely have come up over and over again in my podcast, The Cinephiles, which is an exploration of great films where every week we do a, a deep, deep dive into a great film. And I think there's so many lessons from the O'Brien books about writing and relationships and friendships and how to handle historical context that mm -hmm. in continually inform me in terms of my own writing and in terms of the work I do on the podcast. Fantastic. Fantastic. And how far back into your life do we have to go to get the moment when you first got introduced to O'Brien? It was probably 1992 or three. Oh, wow. And uh, a buddy of mine who is an avid, avid reader like I am said, you have to read these books. And I think the New York Times article had come out yeah. that said, these are the greatest historical novels of all time. And I read Master and Commander and I went, eh. That was okay. I mean, it was, I guess I liked it. And then I put it down. I never picked up Post Captain. And then a year or two later, I went, I keep thinking about that Master and Commander book. So I read it a second time. And then I read Post Captain. And yeah. then I was hooked. Yeah. And what's funny is I've often told people that Master and Commander can be difficult and that sometimes it takes a little while to get into the books and maybe it'll take to Post Captain. Since then, uh, that first book is among my favorites. I just think it's an astoundingly good book. And I wonder what 1993 Steve didn't get the first time he read it. Wow. Well, and that's the, the, one, of the, one of the many great strengths of these books is that you can go back and there are things as you move on at different life stages and you've had different experiences. You see all these other things reflected in what's going on with the characters and it's, uh, it's fabulous, which, which kind of gets us to the theme of today's show. And I remember I, I read these books, um, early 90s, Ian was a young single guy traveling, I think, and having loved Hornblower and then picking up these books and going, wow, this is the, the, real, the real deal here. Yeah. And and having done rereads as uh, as as a married man and as a parent, I read the episodes that have connections with characters and how they interact with children, and I'm really profoundly moved. There's some really great writing and some really kind of telling moments, and that's where we want to talk about this week. We want to talk about how O'Brien wrote about and emoted with us about um, the connection between adults and children, their own children, and children that they just encounter as they're going through life. I think. What's most remarkable about the way he handles children is that Patrick O'Brien treats them as people. Yeah. And that's there's so often in so many books, maybe because we're so far from childhood and we can't really remember what it felt like, where writers treat kids as, oh, kids are kids. They're these, they're these other kind of creatures. They're yeah. these other not fully formed childlike things and so that cliche informs everything that people say about children and that's not how o'brien handles them there are kids in this series from the very beginning until the very last book even until the unfinished book that yeah. are fully formed they're responsible they have personalities they have goals they are connected to the other people in the story in deep and profound ways it's it's pretty remarkable how he handles it it really is and doing all of this as well in the medium of a historical novel so it's not just you know people in a contemporary setting with contemporary values he's doing this through the prism one of the many sets of values that have changed over time is the values of how how families are formed and the connection between adults and kids has changed massively so maybe one place we could start is how is O'Brien showing us and teaching us about the culture of, of Regency Britain and Regency the world um, in the way that he uh, in the way that he handles the, the child characters? Well, I think the thing and this is both about the children, but it's O'Brien in general. One of the most amazing things about his writing is that there's no sense of the contemporary. Almost always when you read historical novels, you can feel, oh, this is a story about, you know, ancient Rome that was written in the 80s. Yeah. And you could feel the 80s, yeah. even though it's about ancient Rome and they, they never jump out of that. Uh, there are lots of books where they'll use contemporary language or they'll use contemporary ideas or contemporary psychology or analysis in order to understand the past. And that's not what O'Brien's doing. 
O'Brien is right in there. He's writing it as if it's being written from that time. And I think the most remarkable thing to me, I, I don't know if you've heard this, this theory or this idea. There, there's an idea that childhood, as we conceive of childhood in the modern era, is something that was re a recent invention. Hmm. That the idea that a kid should be a kid and they should have this time up until they're like 18 where they get to play and be imaginative and the world is structured around them to have a childhood and that there's even maybe there's one parent at home or there's other professionals whose job is to monitor and protect and create and curate a childhood for these humans. And that is something that didn't exist 100 years ago, unless you were really rich. If you were the prince, sure, that was what was going on. But for most kids, if you're on the farm, you're three years old, you're gathering the eggs or milking the cow or helping plant the seeds. You have a job just like everybody else has a job. You don't have a childhood. And the thing that you see in Patrick O'Brien is there's so many characters who are a part of the world. They are not yeah. treated as children. And the most obvious, or, or what I should say is the most common, but the least obvious is there are all these midshipmen. Sometimes yeah. they call them squeakers. Yeah. And these are these people that you have to remind yourself, this person might be 11 years old, who's carrying gunpowder and cannonballs to be fired, who's in the midst of the wounded, who's risking life and limb, who's yeah. traveling around the world. This is a little tiny kid. Who is expect and not only that, but sometimes you have a little kid who is expected to be an officer in charge of ten adult men. Yeah, that is remarkable. And and the ten adult men more or less accept it. I'm not going to say completely because there are plenty of cases, but in the books and in history where that didn't work out so great. But these people are being trained to take a role as officers and to have an 11 year old, you know, taking command of a bunch of guys in a boat or in the rigging, directing the work of sailors, you know, putting a reef in a sail. It's amazing. I, I love the moments, by the way, where you hear the the gentle guidance of the older sailor, like a guy like Joe Place, yeah. over the young midshipman who can't, and he's not going to say, hey, you're wrong, I'm not going to do that, but they sort of give them a hint of this is what you're supposed to do. It also, by the way, points out this strange distinction, which you're British, so this is huh. more in the British culture than in the American culture, although it exists here too, of this idea of officers and men, that there's a class structure yeah. whereby there are these people that are born to rule on some level, and there's this other group of people who might be just as intelligent, just as qualified, just as capable, but they are born to serve, you know? And, and Barrett Bonden being one of the key examples of that as a guy who yeah. is offered the opportunity to be an officer in the very first book and says, no, nah, that's not for me, yeah. you know, yeah. even though he would probably be a better officer than half the officers we meet. For sure. And we know that there are outstanding officer characters who, who were in the Navy and are in O'Brien's Navy who came, as they say, you know, after through the halls, so like Tom Pulling. Yeah. But Baron, Bonden wants to stay in his world, in the world of the foremast hands, and he's He's okay with the fact that these privileged kids, but kids nonetheless, are going to have are going to be in roles of command. Yeah, Lots, that, that, that's a sort of philosophy and a sort of tolerance of your place in the world that I think is is absolutely nothing to do with the twentieth century. No, <laughs> certainly not with the late twentieth century. And, and of course, for good reason. I am glad that people actually have the ability to step out of their status. You know, that's really good. Yeah. But there is something actually comforting in the idea that you know where you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to yeah. behave, you yeah. know? And I think that's another thing that Patrick O'Brien handles really well. It's also interesting that the way that kids and those midshipmen in particular interact with a character like Stephen Maturin, which is that they have the utmost respect for this brilliant, scholarly, accomplished dude, but they have zero respect for him as a seaman. And so you constantly have these scenes where there's a little kid telling Stephen what to do. No, no, you have to get dressed. You have to go over here. You have to go see the captain. You have to do that. And in a very gentle way for what is the, in their mind, a great man who doesn't know what the hell he's doing, you know? And I, I often see that the, the, the child characters there express a kind of care. I mean, there's care between characters and care between romantic partners. Um, there's a midshipman called Forshaw, I think, mm -hmm. who really looks after St Stephen especially, and also Jack, I think, at a couple of points. points. Sets up these themes within themes within themes. And there's just one I wanted to start watching here. Yeah. In that we've got this midshipman, Forshaw, who's come to find Stephen. And we keep getting... 
these references. So when he comes to find Stephen, Sir Sir called a scarlet young gentleman from the leopard an absurdly beautiful child called Forshaw, who had always been very kind and protective towards Dr. Matron. I found you at last. He describes that he's sort of run all over the island here. Uh, I ran to the hospital. I ran to Madame Tintin's. (laughs) And calm yourself, Mr. Forshaw, said Stephen. How came you to think I should be at Madame Tintin's, Mr. Forshaw, asked Stephen. And you are never to go there yourself either. But (laughs) <laughs> this absurdly beautiful child, and we'll hear more about Forshaw as we go on. And as as Forshaw gets with him here, he says, may I carry your Hurley? And he picks up this deadly bat, this thing that in so much literature foreshadows death. We've got Forshaw carrying it here, and we're also calling out themes of Forshaw and beautiful and innocent and everything, which we continue to strike here. So. I like O'Brien's portrayal of Forshaw as well as not entirely perfect because this kid is a bit uh, a, a bit chatty and drops in these rather lewd remarks about, uh, about Madame Titine's, this house of, house of male entertainment, when they were back ashore. And later on, Forshaw is called into the cabin as Aubrey often summons his midshipmen to find out where they're up to with their observations and quiz them on their astro navigation. And this this innocence even gets Forshaw into trouble with Jack. The midshipmen are recounting this idea that perhaps Abraham was a very good man. Abraham, sir, says Forshaw, whose spirits had recovered with their usual speed. Oh, he was only an ordinary wicked Jew. And Jack fixed him with his eye. Was Forshaw making game of him? It's it's such a shame that his innocence is it just makes him so noticed on the ship yeah. here, so noticed by us, so called out by O'Brien. Yeah. Later, when they get north of Capricorn, the midshipmen with Jack are all stargazing. And Stephen comes across and it says, Forshaw's high young voice could be heard piping about the Southern Cross. You know, even oh. still, O'Brien is taking these little moments to call attention to this beautiful child. And Forshaw does what children often do, which is to repeat phrases and ideas that they've heard in the mouth of adults. <laughs> right, exactly. With, without much judgment or without a filter. Hence the thing about Madame Titine's earlier on. Hence the thing right. about Abraham being oh, only an ordinary wicked Jew. So poor little Forshaw. Yeah. And there's Forshaw, this young midshipman there to comfort him. Here's my jacket, says Forshaw. Stretch out on the thwart. It will be dawn in an hour or two. And we can hold out another week at last. You will be all right. God, this this beautiful boy and his kindness to the doctor. Yeah. Ah, and yeah, maybe Forshaw's there carrying the emotional tones in the story when Jack and Stephen don't have their instruments. There. Yeah, I don't think one substitutes the other, but it's nice to have Forshaw's character there to carry so much of the emotional part. Yeah. Of the story. And then, of course, some of the, the children characters that I'm sure we'll come to get to be the beneficiaries of care themselves. And I think O'Brien seems to really want to draw our attention to the the idea of care and that you don't have to be a parent to care, um, but that there's something, an exchange of the kind of affection and shelter between a, a grown-up and a kid that is really, really special and unique. And the Navy can't function without it, at least not the 18th century Navy. Well, and that it's built into the service is that on some level, Jack has to be a parent, not yeah. just a teacher, but a parent. And then it's like, well, are we going to have Nathaniel Martin on board to be an additional parent? Because yeah. they need to get the classics, which Jack's Jack always regrets that he really never did learn his Latin and his Greek. And that there are things that he doesn't understand about the world that he hopes these kids, these squeakers, will get what he didn't give them. And that we have built into that, as we said, someone like Joe Place, who's someone, they call them someone's sea daddy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and so... It's what's really strange about it is that this is institutional parenting rather than the biological parenting. We're going to send our kid to sea, and there are going to be a bunch of people, some good, some bad, some who care, some who are mean, some who are gentle, who are going to raise these people to be a specific thing, which is an officer in the Navy. And one of the most unsettling characters and the most unsettled and dysfunctional is uh, is Hollum in The Far Side of the World, who is portrayed as a rather different dysfunctional character in the movie. Um, right. And, be, and he's, he's, an, he's an adult midshipman and he's not really able to fit into it. He can't be a kid and accept parenting and direction and care and institutional being looked after. 
but he's not really got the emotional skill to to deal with himself in the adult world and he ends up in this very destructive relationship with the gunner's wife and we all know how that ended well it's so interesting because and again it's because patrick o'brien doesn't bring modern sensibilities to things but you have all these people that are on the ship together and you can sort of see their humanity in a modern sense see what we might call you know introversion or psychological issues like like one of them again this isn't about children but like lord clomford is one of the most fascinating characters and i have continued to go like is he bipolar is he schizophrenic like what exactly is the deal and the same is true with someone like hollam this everyone is dealing with their particular psychological character flaws character attributes and they're dealing with them within this very formal and structured setting you know, where behavior is supposed to be a very, very specific way. And Patrick O'Brien doesn't go into their heads. So we don't really know exactly what some of these characters are thinking. We're just observing them through someone like Stephen, who's very observant, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I kind of get the impression, in lots of respects, I think Jack is a sort of model for the old 18th century. And if we look at him as an 18th century father, he's a bit puzzled. Um, he's a bit absent. I mean, his kids... Um, the twins and baby George are, are kind of played for laughs for quite a lot of the time, but the moments when he feels most isolated from home and when he feels furthest away, um, are the moments I think when he reads letters from Sophie and he reads about the kids and how they're growing up. What, what do you think of, of Jack as a parent? Well, I, I, I think you can't, uh, it was funny. I remember this is a slight digression, but I remember thinking about, Uh, You hear all these stories of the kids of famous people, the kids of wealthy people, and, you know, that they're acting out in one way or another or drug addiction or whatever problems they might be having. And I had an epiphany once where I went, oh, if you're out in your your Bill Gates or you're Steven Spielberg or you're the president or wherever you are and you are on your life is a mission and you are working, you know, massive, massive hours and traveling constantly, it's not that you're a bad parent. It's that you're not there. Yeah. Like parenting, a lot of it is just your presence. Yeah. It is the m- amount of time that you spend with the child and the lessons that you teach aren't taught by what you say to them. It is through osmosis. It is through you modeling a certain kind of behavior. And if you're not there, you're not being a parent. And Jack is not there. Yeah. Jack is far more of a parent to William Babington yeah. or or to Reed or to Oaks or to any of these people that came in as midshipmen than he is to his own kids. Hmm. And then he comes back expecting to have a certain relationship or expecting to have a certain understanding with his children and having, you know, we all do this is that you have an image in your head of, okay, when I get home, this is what's going to happen. And that's never what happens because hmm. he doesn't know those kids and they don't know him. I mean, he's away for years, literally years at a time. And you, you've got to wonder about the way that is it's set up and it's portrayed in a very consistent way, in a very insightful way, all the way through the books. You've got to wonder about what what O'Brien's reflections were about the different experiences he had had as a parent. And there's mm. some separation and some tragedy and some big uncertainty about how that all worked out in his life. Um, but I think he, there was a lot that he wanted to say about what he thought should be or might be the relationship between present and absent parents and their kids. There are two really, really focal adult-child relationships um, one that is was right at the beginning of the canon. And I, I really, really loved going back into our treatment of the of, of HMS Surprise and the character of Dill. Uh, what was your take, Steve? And but maybe even also between when you first read the story of Dill and maybe if you read later in life. It's among the most crushing moments in all of the books. Yeah. Dill is a beautifully drawn character. She is... And, and, and it's so interesting because, again, this happens several times in O'Brien where the child is acting as the parent and the adult is really the child. And Stephen Maturin, in his relationship with Dill, is the child, is that he is a person who is emotionally vulnerable because of his relationship with Diana at the time. Yeah. He's in a new environment because he's in India. He is unsure of what he is supposed to do and where is he supposed to go. And he is literally taken under the wing of this girl 
who teaches literally she feeds him by hand at one point yeah. and she continually tells him this is what you should do this is where you should go this is what you should wear and even in the moment i remember because i remember dill and every you know that whole story so clearly there's a moment i think with diana where it's very clear that diana and dill are communicating about steven in a way that he doesn't understand and that when <laughs> she meets dill she they have a perfect understanding or Diana has a perfect understanding of who Dill is. And again, in the way because Patrick O'Brien doesn't just say, here's who this person is and this is where they come from and this is their history and backstory and all that. He never says that is he gives you clues mm -hmm. and he drops little hints. And so, like, there's this moment where you discover that she is of a lower caste, that she is an untouchable or something like that. Yeah. And and all of these things sort of fall into place. Like, I'm pretty sure in the book, you never actually meet her. We don't see when Stephen actually first meets Dill. They're just already in some kind of a yeah. relationship. Let's just hold on a second. Mike, I think, has a great perspective on where we actually first got introduced to Dill. Well, I, I think, in, and, and I'm not sure that this is Dill, but it sounded like it to me. You know, we've got um, O'Brien writes, Stephen came aboard from time to time. You know, he was wandering all around uh, Bombay here. And he came aboard from time to time once with a mathematical Farsi who wished to see the frigate's navigation table, <laughs> once with a child of unknown race who had found him lost among the blue buffaloes of the Angir Maiden in danger of being trampled and who had led him back by the hand, talking all the way in an Urdu adapted to the meanest understanding. I mean, this has got to be Dill. You know, she's already parenting Stephen She's found him. She's saved him. And she's speaking to him like a little child in, in, you know, what is one of her native tongues trying to say it so that he can understand it. I mean, this has got to be Dill. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we hear in the text later on that Dill herself is speaking in this very carefully, um, uh, easily adapted Urdu. Um, we had some conversation on one of the Facebook book groups lately about whether she would really have been speaking Urdu or she might have been speaking something else. I think the, right. the kind of the regional native language around Bombay would be Marathi, but it could well be that she's speaking Urdu to him in this very plain, boiled down way so that he, a, a, a mere ugly, uncultured brute as he is, can understand her. And then you slowly discover what her situation is. And I'm telling you, her desire for the Bengals and what <laughs> so happens. Touching. He makes this great gesture of generosity. He's kind of recruiting Dill to act as his messenger a little bit and asking her to give some guidance and help him around the city. And he knows that the thing that her heart most desires is this set of bangles. She really covets jewelry and he decides that the, the gift that he's going to give her are these three bangles. Stephen promised to grant Dill three bangles, and as he hands over this gift of these three items of jewellery, O'Brien writes, it's as though she too had been warned in a dream. Dill stopped breathing and watched with motionless intensity. Here is the first wish, he said, taking out one bangle, and the second, and the third. She reached forward a hesitant hand and touched them lightly. She held one for a moment and put it solemnly down, staring at her arm and the gleaming band of silver. The rapture of possession seized her. She burst into wild laughter, slipped them all off and on, gave them a name. She leapt up and spun, jerking her thin arms to make the bracelets clink. Earnest, loving thanks, broken down by exclamations. How had he known? Wisdom nothing to him, of course. Such a blaze of light. Might she have the cloth that they were wrapped in? And... O'Brien really delights in writing nicely to us when characters are overcome by joy. We had that uh, a little while ago when Pullings was promoted, and we've got it again here right. when Dill receives this gift of bangles from Stephen. It's so, so touching and so warm and joyful. And all the more touching when the tragedy that's coming unfolds before us on the page. And then keeping and then finding a place for her. Right. And this walk that Stephen makes back into town gets us to this I, I think we both think this is one of the, the saddest, the most poignant, the most moving parts of the whole, the whole canon, really, as this relationship and this connection between Stephen and Dill that's been built up in just a couple of chapters is, is dead, finds a crowd of people gathered around a body and the body is Dill and she's been mugged and murdered for the jewellery that Stephen bought for her. Well, 
you know, one thing, Ian, besides being totally devastated, and I remember I could barely record parts of that episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was struck looking back how Stephen had right before this talked about Dill and his concerns about what happens next, about how as a child she's so alive and she's so in the present and everything is so meaningful and, you know, that basically it's all downhill from here that, yeah. you know, what's she going to have in front of her? And he's, he's so worried about trying to get Diana to look after her while he's gone and what might happen to her. But even so, you know, he has this long talk about, you know, just for all of us, you know, that, that childhood is kind of the time and then we sort of fall off and we have this theme coming back later as we watch Jack age. So, you know, it struck me and I I certainly never thought about it in my initial grief that in, in a way, even though we know we've got this concern about Stephen being responsible through the bangles for Dill, it also kind of takes her at her highest moment and, she goes out at that moment, at which I, I don't mean to you know, think that that's a good thing at all, but it, it lightened my heart just a little bit. I think, I think we talked about this a bit in the episode. I think we're meant to take something uh, re- redeeming and lightening from, from this passage, even though it's very, very sad. As Stephen steps up at the end and says, you know, I am of her cast. I think this was oh. you know, one of the most fabulous lines for me in the canon and in life to say, when we get that realization that it doesn't matter who we are or where we're from or what our backgrounds are. And we, and we know Stephen has got this incredibly different background. Dill has this incredibly different background. Jack, this incredibly different background. And these people come together so closely and we all are of each other's cast. That, you know, what a, what a takeaway for me, um, written decades ago by Patrick O'Brien, but a yeah. timeless truth for all of oh, us. Oh, for sure. And also because of, again, the nature of this culture, here's this tragic event in Stephen's life that that he must feel responsible for, you know, to some degree. I mean, he gave her the bangles, which led to her death, you know, and Stephen never talks about it. He doesn't go, hey, Jack, you're my best friend. This thing just happened and I just can't, you know, I'm so upset. He never shares it. He literally never speaks of Dill again. Yeah. He just holds that pain inside him. I, it's just crushing. Yeah. And and we learn about it through Jack observing this and supposing what might have happened and I think attributing it to Diana and writing about it to Sophie. It so you know, adds extra, extra poignancy that it's all not really dealt with and nobody's able to kind of talk about it. Yeah. <sighs> it's, it's, ter- it, it's funny. I've thought a lot about, we live in the world where you're supposed to talk about your feelings. Where that is the, okay, you have pain, you should talk about the pain. We're in the post-Freudian, post-analytical world where healthy psychology comes from exposing and discussing things. That friends and relationships and, and, and husbands and wives should talk about the issues that are between them. And when you read Patrick O'Brien, these are people that never talk. <laughs> they, they never talk. In fact, it's, it's it, you know, like there's moments where Stephen says, I wouldn't want to resort to personal questions. You know, or or Stephen says a thing uh, where he goes at some point, like, you know, someone was on, on the verge of unburdening themselves. And he's so glad that they didn't, because if they did, that would always be between them. Someone yeah. you'd always have this information and it would it would hurt the friendship. Yeah. And we're the opposite. And I go back and forth. I, I think in general, we're better off uh, for being able to talk about our feelings and all those things. But I also think. There's some stuff that maybe you shouldn't have said some stuff that maybe would have been better if you didn't put this out there because now it's always out there. And so I feel very sad. And the other thing too, I I firmly believe, and I've thought about this a lot. I think Jack and Steven might be the greatest friendship in all of literature. Mm. I can't think of one, you know, there's, you know, there's Harry Potter and Hermione and Ron. There's Sherlock Holmes and Watson. There's the girls and little women. There's some, there are a few other ones, but I don't think anything goes to Jack and Stephen. And so even though there's a million things they actually haven't talked about with each other, they understand each other perfectly. Yeah. You know what I mean? <sighs> and you can see perhaps that O'Brien's looking back at the world and he maybe he's quite aware that he's writing to, to begin with in the late 60s, early 70s. And sometimes I get the impression that he's commenting on 
the sort of sociological and psychological culture changes going on in the 60s and 70s. But I think this thing about kids, it runs, runs deeper. I think there's a lot in there about his life and his perspective on, on, on giving and receiving care. You know, what's really funny. Surprisingly for me, I've never looked into him as a person. So what is it about his history or his childhood that you think he's kind of reflecting in these pages? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I have hesitated all the way through the life of the show about going into this. First of all, because there are more or less two accounts. Um, as there's the account in the, the Dean King biography written in the early 2000s. And Dean King started out as a super fan and went investigating and found out some things. Um, and then there was his son, Nikolai Tolstoy, his stepson, sorry, Nikolai Tolstoy, mm-hmm. who after his death wrote a sort of, uh, it's now a two volume counterpart to that, the authorized, as it were, biography. And Dean King discovered that you know, Patrick O'Brien was not Patrick O'Brien's name. There was a, there was a, a wife and a child of, uh, of O'Brien's associated with the first marriage, the first child died of spina bifida. And there's an open question. I think Dean King sort of described the breakdown of that family as an abandonment by O'Brien and Tolstoy's adamant that it was not an abandonment, at least not of the child, and that the child had died before the marriage finally broke up and he married uh, married Mary. So, uh, and there seemed to have been at least sometimes awkward, if not permanently fractured, relationships between O'Brien and the other members of his family, certainly with his father and perhaps also with and with his stepson and his son. And I'm not going to come down firmly on the side of the Dean King story or on the side of the Nikolai Tolstoy story, but it's really clear, I think, from just taking a look at both of those two accounts, that this was a, a, a troubled person who had had some successful but also some unsuccessful relationships in his life and most especially had been troubled by some of the relationships with children and what constituted a family. And was also an intensely private person and an intensely introspective person and also in, incredibly widely read and generous and scholarly in so many ways. And there you go. I think that's what's at the heart of it. And I think that's one of the reasons why Peak O'Brien was 1992 to early 2000s and some of the new scholarship into his life came along. And I think there were some, you know, there were some pieces written in public that said he's not such a great guy. Um, and I don't know where the truth lies. I, that's, that's really fascinating. I, I, I think we, you know, far too often hold standards for our authors to live up to that are not realistic. People, yeah. people are people. Yeah. And frequently what writers do, certainly what I've done as a writer is you're always writing about yourself on some level, even yeah. if you're writing science fiction and aliens and fantasy and things like that, the, the, the heart and the emotion, it has to come from somewhere. And that somewhere is from within you. Yeah. And so, it, it, and what's so interesting is like you take a character like Stephen Maturin, who again, you know, I, I don't have to tell the people listening to the show that this is a remarkable character. And he is as wise and introspective and perceptive as just about anybody else. And yeah. he does the most foolish, most self destructive things when it comes to his own emotional life yeah. in particular of course his relationship with diana is that he is as controlled as he is he's not in control yeah. you know what i mean yeah, yeah. and i think what you said about patrick o'brien i am sure that he is going through maybe not consciously but retreading those areas of his life that are painful through yeah. his characters You know, because regardless if it's the version where he abandoned a family or he didn't, those are still stories of great personal pain. And the thing, too, is that you have these romantic relationships like Jack and Sophie and Stephen and Diana. They are never okay. It's not like Jack marries Sophie and then everything is okay. Mm -hmm. It's not. And even in the moments where Stephen and Diana finally come together in what, you know, they call their true marriage, that doesn't mean they're okay. They're not okay because people are messed up. People are weird. People are crazy. People have miscommunications. And certainly when you're separated by thousands of miles and years of time and only sparse letters in between for contact, the, the, the possibility of trauma and conflict and misunderstanding is magnified exponentially. And so the fact that these relationships even manage to continue is kind of remarkable. It is. It is. It's, um, it's incredible as you say it's it must be a response to things that happened in his life and it's very telling that you know he's he's portraying complex 
um, flawed people, and I'm sure he's aware of the complexity and the flaws of his own character. It sounds as if he didn't choose to have those pointed out to him by real humans in his life, but it sounds as though he was he had the the chops to write about them in literature. So, well, none of us really like our flaws pointed out to <laughs> no, us. No, There's no, nobody no. that relishes that experience, and and he mocks himself quite quite successfully all the way through the books. One of the other remarkable things, and I don't want I know you've only gotten so far. Did you just finish Far Side of the World? Is that the yeah. last one you've done? Yeah. The other thing that he does that's so incredible, and it really relates to children. I mean, when we meet Jack and Stephen, how old are they supposed to be? Like early 20s? Yeah, yeah. Maybe a little older, but not much. He he manages to mature those characters so subtly and so carefully over time. So that the by the time you get to the end of the book, and I won't spoil what's going on, these are very different people. Yeah. But he also does the same thing. When we meet William Babington, he's a little kid. Yeah. And... And Tom Pullings isn't that much older. And we get to see them in the course of the books become fully competent adult officers who have been trained by Jack, but now can actually do those jobs. I won't say as well as he can, but are real adults. That's, yeah. again, another remarkable thing that doesn't happen in a lot of books. Yeah, the, partly just because we have the long enough perspective of this great big set of story arcs. and I think, But I think O'Brien's oh, obviously also enjoying that and it's it's great you know they're, they have their imperfections babington likes to chase the ladies you know sure but then he he really i i, I think this is in your timeline still yeah. he actually settles down he falls in love yeah you know yeah, yeah. sincerely and 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 to, to his benefit and to her benefit um we've got the girls we've got the sweeting girls from the the melanesian island that was ridden with smallpox uh or something and and they were rescued and for me, that was the the moment of. It looked pretty obviously like a resolution of the the, the tragedy of Dill. Here's the opportunity once again mm. to to lack, look after a girl. In this case, two girls, and to 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 see it through and to bring them into life and find them a place in the world and nurture them. You know, it's funny. It literally never occurred to me that they are connected to Dill, and of course, that makes perfect sense. What what's so interesting again is the the lack of putting someone oneself out into an emotional relationship. In other words, if a modern person spent time with these two girls who need a parent, you would come to feel feelings of love and parental responsibility and all those things. Stephen never says that. He doesn't go, these girls are now my daughters. He is continually pawning them off. So we get on the boat. And now it's with, I think Jimmy Ducks is taking care of them because yep. obviously they come under livestock, I think. Yeah, exactly. And then when we get to Australia, he's like, let's put them in an orphanage. You know, like he is, he, I think is, I think Stephen has a tendency to push away human yeah. connection or mm. emotion that my, and maybe this is because of experiences like Dill. Well, I mean, frankly, when we meet him, we know he's been through some terrible tragedies, certainly in relationship to the uprising, but there's some implications that there might have been romantic things. We know he's been out on many, many duels. I think he is, and he even says, I think in Master and Commander, that he couldn't bear another disappointment, you know, when he's worried that Jack might not be sincere in his desire to have him come aboard as ship surgeon. And so I think Stephen has some pretty profound walls up to to real human connection and yet he does take care of those girls one yeah. way or another he does uh certainly he, he gets to spend longer with them and we spend longer with them than we all got with dill and i think for for a reader that's a great payoff because i think we all really really felt that you know it's, i remember thinking about this it's so short we get two chapters a chapter and a half to get to know dill and really enjoy the connection between her and steven and then she's gone um, and I hope nobody minds a spoiler that these sweeting girls that we're going to come across, I think it's in the nutmeg of consolation. They're going to be with us for a, for a little while longer, despite Stephen trying to find places in in orphanages and in ships crew for them. Anything else in the in the latter half? Anything that we should be looking forward to as we're standing here, pretty much halfway through the series? I would say so. In the latter half, and trying not to spoil anything for those of you who haven't made it all the way through these books. One of the great tragedies is 21, is yeah. this unfinished book. I, I, I told myself I was never going to read it. And then, of course, I did. 
and now I've read it several times. And, and I just finished my trip through all the books again, and I get to the middle of 21 when it just sort of stops. Yeah. And it's so sad. But one of the biggest tragedies of that is I think Patrick O'Brien introduces an incredibly interesting character in the last two books, or in, in the last book and 21. And I would have loved to see the that kid grow up. I think he that that is a he introduced maybe one of the purest, most heroic, unflawed characters of all of Patrick O'Brien gets introduced as a young man in the very end of the series. And I could see a whole series of books with that guy. I just think, oh, my I was fascinated by every moment he was in the books. And I think also. You know, the last few books, there are amazing things in them. They are not at the level of the first set of books. But this character I was really interested in. And his name's Horatio, which is yeah. kind of cool. <laughs> Very good. Very good. We've got that to look forward to. And Steve, we, we've got lots more. I, I think there are yeah emotional highs and lows. And there's lovely episodic set pieces. And there's humor and all these other things to come as our characters get older and as they build more relationships with children and with other adults and as we meet more of them. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really great to have you all along. It's been loads of fun. I hope we get to talk about more POB stuff again in the future. I think you and I are working on something that might come to fruition pretty soon. Um, and remind us all, please, where, where can we find you in the world of the internet and where can we find your podcast work? So you can uh, follow me on Twitter at SR Morris and on Instagram at SR Morris one, my podcast, the cinephiles that C I N E dash F I L E S. We have explored movies all the way back to the silent era, like Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton through the big Lebowski and star Wars and Lawrence of Arabia and citizen Kane and Halloween. And uh, it's a wonderful life. We're just it, on a three-part exploration into Die Hard. We did Die Hard at the very beginning of the show. Our show was about an hour long, and they've gotten longer and longer since. And people said, <laughs> you got to redo this one. So we are now a three-part one of Die Hard. We also, at the beginning of the year, spent two or three months dealing with Francis Ford Coppola and the Godfather films. So if you're interested in serious, serious deep dives into great films, uh, check out the cinephiles. If you are a Star Trek fan, I just launched a second podcast with uh, Scott Mance, who's a great Star Trek episode. And like The Lover's Hole, we are walking through every episode in the original series with some deep, deep analysis. And that show is called Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. So that's The Cinephiles and Enterprise Incidents with Scott and Steve. If you want some more time hearing my lovely voice. <laughs> Not only yours, but they're, they're great shows. Like I gotta say, I really love the treatment of The Godfather. Oh. That was that was that was my companion for most of the first part of the uh, of the summer. So once again, great to have you with us. Thank you so much for talking, Patrick O'Brien, and I hope we get to talk again soon. Thank you. So it was great to have Steve with us. We want to say another big thank you to Steve Morris from the Cinephiles podcast. And it sounds like we're about at the end of our discussion about Patrick O'Brien and children. It's it's interesting all this talk about children. It seems to be just a great intro to our next volume in the canon. I mean, as as we know, and, and I don't want to uh, do a spoiler here, but we're going to be introduced to a really important child of Jack Aubrey's. And maybe I should just leave it at that. What do you think, Ian? I, I, I think you should. But let's wrap this up by going all the way back to Master and Commander. Oh, I love it. We've talked a lot about O'Brien's foreshadowing and we've talked about a lot how he plays a very long game in his story arc and who knows how planned this was. Uh, Mike, there's a moment where Stephen Maturin is reflecting on authority and its influence on men, grown men, and the fragility of their egos as a result. And maybe that's pointing us in some certain direction. Yeah, I, I think Stephen is talking about how you know, authority kind of makes people not even human anymore. And he and, and he's thinking about Jack and he's thinking that Jack, he says, is direct and unaffected, an amiable man as as could be wished. And so indeed, in most ways, is J.A. himself, though a certain careless arrogancy of power appears at times. But then Stephen gets to the point, his cheerfulness at all events is still with him. 
how long will it last? What woman, political cause, disappointment, wound, disease, untoward child, defeat, what strange, surprising accident will take it all away? Here we are, you know, chapter six of Master and Commander. Talk about a long game. Oh, yeah. So, Mike, 10 books in, I, I don't think we're done learning about children and the Patrick O'Brien characters and the Aubrey Matron universe. I don't think we're done being surprised by the twists and turns that adult-child relationships can take. I think that we're just going to have to keep going. Oh, I think we are. I think we are. And there, you know, and there's a whole number of little references to natural children sprayed throughout the first 10 books. I think it's, it's just kind of a little late motif that goes under from Mrs. Williams to uh, various people, which we're going to have picked up again in reverse of the metal. And uh, so I, I don't know about you, Ian, but for me, I just love dragging myself out of bed and thinking maybe, just maybe, Next week, we could have a little bit more Patrick O'Brien. What what would you think of that? Oh, Mike, with all my heart. Oh, and with all my heart as well. Gosh, it's good to be back.